welcome to Elements of Ayurveda, Empowering Wisdom of Life. I'm your host, Colette, and in this podcast, I hope to empower you to take charge of your own health by sharing the holistic teachings of Ayurveda, the ancient healing tradition from India. We will also discuss topics like health and wellness, nutrition, yoga, fitness, meditation, breath work, and much more, as well as interviewing lots of inspiring people along the way. My humble wish is to help you to connect to your true nature, to Mother Nature, and to each other. If you like the content, be sure to subscribe to the show, and the new episodes will automatically download for you to enjoy. If you're new to Ayurveda, I recommend you check out the first couple of episodes where I do an introduction to Ayurveda along with the history and philosophy. And I also give an introduction to the three doshas or mind-body types of vata, pitta and kapha. And now, here's the show. Hello and welcome to Elements of Ayurveda. In this episode, I'm very excited to welcome James Bailey. Now, James Bailey inspires an awakening to authenticity at the highest expression of faith in oneself on the path of yoga and healing. His teachings are eclectic and entertainingly provocative. He is sought out by yoga schools for his vast knowledge in traditional Eastern teachings and modalities, and his ability to bridge them to modern day living and individual healing. James is a third generation physician. Ayurveda and Oriental medicine practitioner, Ayurveda and yoga educator, and yoga teacher trainer, who has been living with yoga and Ayurveda for 30 years. His training includes five years of formal clinical studies in Oriental medicine and training in Ayurveda with many Ayurvedic doctors and therapists in Kerala, South India, where he spends time teaching and studying while on retreat. He heads the Savanti Institute and its signature Ayurveda Wellness Counselor Program and leads retreats to India each February with his Savanti Adventures. He's lived in India for up to a year and has been back 17 times since. James, you love India, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In India, I can't seem to be ever fulfilled. Every time I go, there's something new for me there. So yeah, I do love India. Yeah, yep. yeah, it definitely has uh, taken a hold on you. And it's and it's wonderful wisdom. Yes, it so, has. So I see from your bio that you're a third generation physician. Now, how did growing up in with a family of physicians, how did that impact your path? And how did you get introduced to Ayurveda? So there's a yeah. Two big questions there, but tell us about you growing up and and how you led to discover Ayurveda. Yeah, well, growing up with my father as a as a surgeon and, and, a, and a physician, um, I think from the earliest memories of my life, I, I, I knew I was going to be the same, or at least in some way that was unique to me. Um, and I think really that 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 desire to practice Western medicine was a fairly constant theme of, in, in my youth, uh, all the way until my early twenties. And um, um, but you know there were a number of experiences that I had that changed the way I would see healing and see changed the way that I would see my own um, role that I could play in in healing others. And um, a lot of those. Uh, sort of changes in, in, in perspective came about while I was living in Africa and in India, India for a couple of years. Uh, and this was back in the late 80s. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I think it was never really, a, and there's never any question for me that I was going to be some form of a doctor. I um, And I don't even think I really knew I was going to go outside of the realm of Western medicine at all until uh, those experiences in traveling okay. uh, happened. Wow. So can you tell us a little bit about those experiences? I know I read a li- some on your biography on your website, and I was fascinated by them. Can you share a little bit about those significant yeah. experiences? Yeah. So back in 1988, I was living in West Africa in Ghana mm. for a year. I was uh, at that time practicing international medicine and um, infectious disease, epidemiology. Uh, this was before um, my interest in Ayurveda really started to take off. And um, I was working for Jimmy Carter in Ghana, and uh, I had uh, I was young, my you know, mid twenties. I had, um, you know, 
was working for Jimmy Carter. I was working for the USAID. I was working for the Ghanaian uh, Ministry of Health, sort of collaborations on um, eradicating diseases, uh, particularly one that we were working on called the guinea worm. And um, during that time, that year that I was working in, in Ghana, I uh, picked up malaria, which was pretty endemic to the area. And um, I was also studying uh, music on the weekends um, when I was in um, Accra, which is the capital city. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a music teacher. I was studying uh, an instrument called the balafone, which is a similar to the Western xylophone, only it's made of um, hand-carved wood slots and gourds underneath and sheepskin to kind of tie it all together. And uh, when I missed my, my music lesson from my teacher, um, I never missed a, a lesson, so he was concerned. So he uh, he walked um, to my house, which was about five kilometers or so, and um, saw me that I was in bed and sick. And uh, I was kind of surprised to see him because he didn't have a car. And I just thought that was really remarkably kind of him. And mm. um, he uh, looked in my eyes and asked me some questions. And um, um, he was traditional Ghanaian, African and from northern Ghana, the, the town of Wa. And uh, this so and I was living down in southern Ghana near the coast in the town of Accra. So he um walked back to his place and uh, grabbed some of her traditional herbs and um put his balafone, his instrument on his back and walked back to me again. And you know, this was eighty eight, so I, I don't know for how many of the audience are old enough to remember that time, but there weren't as many health food stores and, you know, herb, herbs were not as available right. at least in, in, it, that I recall, mm -hmm. you know, there was no whole foods. There was little, <laughs> little co-ops, you know, and that was about it. And if you were into herbs, you were kind of on the funky fringe. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it was pretty, it was new for me to have someone even try to heal me using herbs. So he comes back uh, and it's late at night and he, um, makes a tea with the with these uh, very mangled-looking knot of herbs uh, that I didn't recognize, obviously, because I wasn't a neurobiologist yet. And um, he made it really strong and laid me down on a, on, a, on some pillows uh, in a room. And you know, I don't know if you know much about architecture in uh, Africa, but most things are made of, like, cement, and right. so which is kind of convenient for music because it's very echoey and, and the sound kind of echoes, it reverbs a lot. So he makes me drink the tea, and then he plays this melody over and over and over, sort of a rhythm that they used in, in, in his part of, of Ghana for healing uh, malaria. It was like a malaria um, sound, vibrational wow. music. And um, I just relaxed and, and breathed and listened to it and went off into a, some type of a trance or something and then fell asleep. And I woke up in the morning and um, – he was gone and the malaria was gone. The fevers, everything was gone. Oh my and, goodness. And yeah, it, it was it was remarkable and kind of surprising. And I was excited and uh, just in awe. And I went back and um, uh, spoke with him a couple of days later after I rested up more. And he told me that he came from a, a musical healing family tradition in northern Ghana where the music and the healing are not separate disciplines. They really come from the same... Uh, family lineages, and they use sound uh, to heal, and they use different vibrational rhythms on the on the balafone, uh, in addition to different herbs. And um, you know, I have to I have to say I, I I believed him because I was not getting better, and within that short period of time, with the herbs and and his his music or what do you want to call it, his sound healing, um, it went away. So wow. that changed my 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 perspective on not just healing, but what medicine could be. Um, I had always been kind of a naturalist in my own way and loved rock climbing and hiking and camping, backpacking and, you know, in California for, for many years and um, loved uh, everything, you know, that nature offered. And here was a way for me to understand a healing modality or a healing paradigm that was natural. Yeah. So I came back from that. Well, that and another experience um, so that wasn't enough. I, after that year in Ghana, I went to India and um, did not work in India because uh, just couldn't find work. Indians don't hire outsiders mm -hmm. in the same way Africans do to, to help with anything. <laughs> Indians are very proud, proud 
you know, if not kind of, um, yeah, just proud. Just really proud people. And they don't be like, you know, hey, we have, you know, 100,000 unemployed PhDs and MDs. We don't need you, white person. Go away. Right, right. <laughs> so, um, so I ended up just traveling around and uh, studying, um, since I'm in India, right, just studying yoga and meditation, Buddhism, all the, all the great traditions that are in India. And um, ended up in South India living in a, an intentional community called Auroville, uh, which was – um, for those of the, who don't know Auroville, it's in Pondicherry. It's an old French enclave uh, in, in India. And established, it was set up by um, Sri Aurobindo, uh, was the founder, one of the great yogis and freedom fighters. So I'm there, and I, I, I pick up a parasite or two. I'm not sure what it was. All I know is I woke up after a couple of days of cramps. I woke up in the middle of the night with um, intestinal bleeding, pretty mm-hmm. severe intestinal bleeding, and uh, was able to make it to sunrise and um, started asking for people for ideas of where I could go to find a doctor. And one person uh, said, here, take my bike. There's an Ayurvedic doctor uh, a couple of kilometers up this dirt road past some villages. And um, he can help you or she. I don't even know if it was a male or female because I have no memory of it. So I'm delirious. I'm, I'm, I hardly even remember riding my bike. And I don't remember walking into the clinic. I have no memory of this experience at all. All I do know is um, that night I'm, I'm, I come back into my room and I've got this bag of herbs. Mm-hmm. And from, you know, it wrote, written in uh, the local dialect and it says, you know, descriptions on how the dosages and things like that. And I take them as instructed and the bleeding stops and the diarrhea stops and the problems under control. And I'm again now I'm double impressed, you know, by traditional uh, medicines. Um, And unusually, I don't have any memory of that person. Like, I don't don't know who. I I always, when I have these interviews, I always like to say, thank you, whoever you were, for saving my life. But um, that, um, and then a third experience later that year when I was in northern India, um, actually, I went to Dharamsala Mm -hmm. to meet the Dalai Lama and to study with him. And he was doing a week-long training there, teaching there. Mm. And um, got sick again. Parasites uh, came back, or it was a new parasite. And I uh, was given the advice to go to the Tibetan Institute of Medical Astrology, which the name itself was already fascinating yeah. me. So, Okay, Tibetan Institute of Medical Astrology. <laughs> okay, so it was a medical clinic that obviously used some kind of astrological insights as well. So I walk in and I don't speak a word of Tibetan and they don't speak a word of English. There were these older monks in their 60s, mm-hmm. 70s, um, this beautiful robes in the short white, blonde, you know, older white hair. And um, so I'm assigned this doctor. I say, you know, my stomach's hurting. He doesn't know what that means. It could be a million things that are wrong with your, your, your intestines. So he reads my pulse for about 20 minutes and I'd not seen that before, at least not that long of a pulse reading. Mm. And I'd never been in a situation where I was diagnosed uh, entirely by pulse reading. Wow. And he read it for 20 minutes? 20 minutes. Wow. Yeah. And I, because he had nothing else to go by except, you know, ow, here, point in my stomach. So, and I've been pulse reading for for decades, but I would never just sit down and do a pulse exam and say, here's what's wrong with you. Here's what I want to give you. It's just a whole nother level of, of confidence and and skill that uh, most Western practitioners, um, I mean, you can certainly give it a shot, but you might miss something, you know, right. because we talk to our, our patients, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and you get most of what you need from talking, and the pulses are usually used to confirm what you what you, what you understand from exactly. talking. But, um, yeah, so there it was. So he gives me this bag of herbs, and I go back, and they work. So, you know, this is the third experience I'm now having where um, – Herbal medicine, natural medicines, different from different lineages, have helped me, and I'm just impressed. I'm really impressed. So by the time those two years are over, and I went back to Los Angeles, um, I didn't want to do anything else. I just wanted to study Eastern medicines. Wow. Well, and that's great because that's what it's all about, isn't it? The uh, particularly in Ayurveda, it's an experiential. 
based healing yeah. system whereas in the western medicine while it has definitely has its you know it has its benefits it's more evidence based whereas in right. you experienced you had three amazing opportunities to experience this healing for yourself and um and that then had this huge impact on your life to go and and study it so what did you choose then to study first when you went to well First, so when I came back and I knew I was going to move in that direction, um, the family karma that I had of being raised by a surgeon, mm. uh, and not just, I want to just say, not just any surgeon, my father is, is one of the greats, and he was one of the, you know, top people in the field of ear, nose, and throat, and head and neck surgery. Um, I mean, like, wrote all the books. Wow. Like, if you any ENT or otolaryngologist and you looked in their office, their main office where their books were, the wall would be covered with uh, Bailey books. So mm-hmm. those are, he was the guy. And so that leaves, you know, growing up with that, that, res- that level of respect, that level of accomplishment, that level of, um, you know, everywhere you go, your people praise your, your father. Yeah. It just, it was hard for me to imagine going straight into Ayurveda and not having a license to, right. to practice. So um, I just couldn't do it at that point. So I, Went into uh, or Chinese medicine. Great. I went to medicine and got uh, a license uh, five years later, and um, gave it a couple of years of practice. And as soon as I felt confident with my acupuncture and Chinese herbology skills, I went straight into um, uh, a real certification program in Ayurvedic medicine. Right. And so, do you combine the two? Do you find because they are based on the elements? and connection to nature but there are many differences as well do you find now that you combine the two or do you just take all your experiences and bring it into your your practices your yeah I, I, I it's hard once you've studied two systems of medicine to not draw on them constantly sure. um in fact you know there i really had two kinds of people who would come into me um in most of my practice One was the person who said, I want to know my constitution. I want to know how to nourish myself. You know, just do Ayurveda so I can do this myself. Mm -hmm. I'd be fine. Let's do that. And then the other person would come in and say, I'm feeling sick. I have a certain condition. What what should I do? And for those people, you know, I had a lot more of a a broader lens, so to speak. And sometimes I would just see a classic Ayurvedic paradigm or a classic Ayurvedic pattern. Okay. And just like, this is vata, this is kapha, this is pitta. And then sometimes it would just be a classic uh, Chinese medicine, medicine pattern. Oh, like interesting. I, I, so I would just use whatever medicine I felt had the clearest perspective on that condition. Mm-hmm. And, um, I then use those skills. And occasionally I would do both. Um, you know, you could, uh, with the right training, if you have these, you know, trainings, you could do uh, an abhyanga and, 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 and massage someone for, you know, 45 minutes with warm oils and then put needles in somebody. Yes. needles. Because, and there are certain conditions where that's just better than doing needling because you can't needle uh, yin deficiency away. Mm-hmm. You can't needle chi stag- You can needle chi stagnation, but if they're depleted and they're yin depleted, they, they're ojas or jing depleted, they really need those oils. They need that base of nourishment and relaxation that even... You know, putting steel needles in people is great, but not always the most relaxing thing for everybody. Um, some people are nervous of needles. So, you know, combining the, the needles with shiradara, for example, is, a, is an incredible way of working with um, uh, psychological and stress-like disorders. So, yeah, I, I like to use them both. Not, not always at the same time, mm-hmm. uh, but, um, yeah, whatever, whatever I felt was going to be the most uh, effective. Wow, how wonderful for your clients to have all that knowledge and that you have all that knowledge and such a variety of healing modalities to choose from, which yeah. is great. And just to tell our listeners that Abiyanga is a self massage with oils, and I've talked about it in previous episodes. And Shiradara is an amazing treatment where you pour warm oil across the forehead, across the third eye, and it's very calming to the Vata dosha and very calming to the nervous system. And um, both are just wonderful healing treatments with warm oils used by Ayurveda. And the, the oil chosen will be specific to that particular person. Isn't that right, James? Yeah, um, but let me just correct something. Uh, Abhyanga sure. can be done by a practitioner to you. Mm-hmm. And 
also can be done to yourself. That's right. Thank you for saying sure. that. Yeah, sure. and that's absolutely sure. something I recommend that people do daily. Thank you for bringing yes. that up because I glossed over that one. Yeah, so a self-massage is one of the key um, traditions and, and key healing traditions in Ayurveda and something that is recommended in your daily dinacharya or your daily routine. Yes, thank you exactly. for bringing that up, James. Yeah, sure. Great. So then, so then you studied uh, Oriental medicine, and then you went to Ayurveda. And what from there? Then seeing clients one on one, and teaching as well. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I had been working with patients since the early '90s um, as an herbalist um, in um, Venice, California. Mm-hmm. Uh, I worked under a, a well-known herbalist named Ron Teagarden. Then uh, went into school in Chinese medicine and got licensed and started practicing that. And then um, around 2000, went back to school to study uh, with uh, Dr. Vijay Apte and um, several other teachers, but the main teacher was Dr. Apte, uh, who's from San Francisco. And um, so, you know, between all of those different modalities and teachings, I've been working on it since 1990, 91. And... Um, yeah, I've seen about, I did the math, um, like around 25,000 patient visits wow. um, since 91. Um, and um, yeah, but at the same time, I've also done a lot of yoga teacher training workshops and things yes. like that. So I try to combine clinical work with travel and teaching. Beautiful. That's great. And you're the founder of the Savanti Institute. Yes. Yeah, so Savanti Institute is a new a new um, a program um, that is uh, offering its sort of signature program. is called the Ayurveda Wellness Counselor Program. Great. And the curriculum is dedicated entirely to um, exposing more people to Ayurveda as a wellness system. Mm-hmm. And there are three levels of training. The level one is for everybody, and it's if you just want to take it to learn how to take care of yourself better for better self-care or for family, you can do that. And then if you want to continue on for NAMA certification as an Ayurveda health counselor, you can uh, uh, go into level two and level three. So level two is more of the advanced programs. There are 17 courses in uh, level two. Each of them are three days long. And um, level three is the uh, clinical uh, supervision uh, program. Love it. We need more of that. Get more people with the, with this wisdom in their pockets so that they can thrive in life. And I love that the level one is if you're not interested in working in this area, but just want it for yourself. That's fantastic. Yeah. And are these yeah. programs in person and online? Yeah, they're both. Okay, okay perfect. That's so um, we're in about seven, eight cities right now. Oh. We have... Um, a few teachers who are teaching level ones, and we have uh, seven teachers uh, who are offering programs, shorter weekend programs at the level two level. So we're just starting the level two programs uh, this spring. Okay, uh, that's great. Taking a few years of level ones to build up a, a big uh, community of level one grads that okay. are in the level two. So, um, yeah, it's growing and evolving and are bringing in some really exciting teachers to help share that, that, te- that those offerings. Oh, fantastic work. Well, well done you on founding this. And I was just, re- when I was reading up on the Savanti Institute, you said that you're, it's um, awakens the greatest gift within us, our authentic self-knowledge. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's why I say in my bio that my, my work is mostly to uh, inspire people to awaken to authenticity because yes. there whether you're on a healing path you know there's something really limiting in your lot in life or whether you're on a spiritual path not that they need to be that different but um whether it's something more of a subtler nature in, in the spiritual side of things and that's limiting in your life the from my understanding the only thing that we can do um is to be true and live true to who we are and to our nature mm-hmm. because if we if we we want to listen to others, and we want to take advice from others. But if we do as others do only, then we're living someone else's life. We're using someone else's medicine. We're using someone else's um, re- revelations or realizations. And those can be inspiring, but, um, you know, we have to find our own. We ha- Authenticity, I, I say, always 
try to say is the highest expression of faith in oneself. Yes. To be yourself, to be unique, to be mm-hmm. your, not necessarily you have to be anyone. Now, when I say unique, don't be someone who's not yourself. You know, don't try to be so eclectic that you that you're not even being yourself. You're not being. You're just being, you know, like someone else. Yes. Really being true to who you are, you know, in, in, in a good way. Mm-hmm. Um, then you're then you're really listening to your own, you know, natural uh, and spiritual, physical and spiritual needs. Because you're one of a kind. There's no one like you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, I agree 100%. And I think that when you are authentic and living your true, uh, letting your true nature show, that that's when things flow and that's when the energy flows and people can feel it. You know, they may not be aware, but they can feel when you're being, when someone's been authentic versus just regurgitating something they learned. So Absolutely. I'm going to go back to your bio now because I read something lovely in your bio and that it was, it, it was, the question was about your favorite activities and you said watching your children grow up and hanging out with your wife and teaching and touring India and watching the wisdom lines on your face grow longer and deeper with time. And I love mm-hmm. that because I really talk a lot about the wisdom stage of life. And I wanted to ask you about your experience there, because I think in our society, there is a negative connotation on this stage of life. And um, that, it, you know, we're, we're not marketed to youth is revered in our society in the West. And I, I really think that's such a shame because there's such wisdom to learn from our elders. Uh, can you tell me about your experience and what transitions you've had to make in your own health and well-being during this period, this shift? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, and I don't mind saying I'm 50, I'm probably proud to say I'm 54 years old. Great. I, am, um, I have a 19 year old son. <clears throat> I have a, um, I'm remarried and have a 20 month old son. Oh, congratulations. Um, another baby, uh, in the oven as oh, we speak. Oh, wow. Great. So I'm getting this, um, second chance at another kind of family experience oh. with very, very mm-hmm. little human beings, uh, that are learning to talk and, and grow. And it's, it's an amazing thing to watch. I think even, I mean, it was precious the first time with my older son, but I think it's even, more, uh, it's more interesting from having the perspective of being older yes. that I get to see things in a, in a different way. Um, but the the comment that I was making about enjoying watching the wisdom lines is really, I mean, to be literal, yes, it's about literally seeing some lines grow around my face, around my eyes, you know, and around my forehead. Like just that's life, you know. And I I think that. Um, you know, I, you can oil your face as much as you want, but some of it's just gonna. You just you can't you can't avoid you know certain aspects of the aging process. And um, Ayurveda speaks to that that we we move into what we call a vata stage of life um, in women uh, after menopause and in men after what we call andropause, which yes. uh, which is a trickier thing to describe because it's not something that's so easily defined. Um, as physical as it is more more mental and emotional because um, women have a more of a drum, a, drum, a, drum, a clear way of, uh, of, of measuring that process of the transition and men we don't lose anything really we might soften yes um, we might obviously lose a little bit of our if not our sex drive definitely maybe it doesn't doesn't drive us as much as it, it we, we, we it used to yeah and um, I mean, look at the mess that's going on around the, the country right now with all the men being called out on their aberrations of their sexuality. Mm-hmm. And it's mar- remarkable how many of them are older and or, you know, have those problems when they were in midlife. So for me to 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 ground into that vata transition um, is imp- it, the first thing you have to do is recognize that you're there and and to 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 love it and to respect it because. Vata doesn't respond well to, you know, denial or not liking things or trying to hide it. Or, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, you can certainly do everything you can to soften it and to slow it down. And I think that's what Ayurveda brings a lot of um, great wisdom to is that not to a- avoid the aging or to avoid the Vata stage, but to make it s- to slow that transition and to s- make it more of a youthful aging process. Yes. Um, than a um, 
than a, than a challenged one. And, uh, um, and that, that's what Ayurveda, particularly the uh, Rasayana, the rejuvenation systems of Ayurveda has taught me so much that um, I can age and, um, um, and not feel younger, really. I really don't feel my age, if I'm honest. I feel, you know, maybe if I had to guess, maybe if I, feel, I feel 30-ish. You know, I don't, I don't really. So, but that doesn't mean that there aren't signs, you know, mm-hmm. Um, you know, being really personal here, but I don't, I don't mind that I tell these things to my patients. So why not, yeah. you know, my students, but you know, like it gets, my skin's getting drier than it used to be. I'm a Pitta Vata, mm-hmm. so I, but I used to be more Pitta yes. than Vata. And now I'm becoming a little bit more Vata than Pitta. Right. Um, yeah. And yeah. actually I wanted to ask you about that because with my clients, um, I have noticed that a lot of particularly pitta predominant constitutions have a very challenging time during this transition. And and a lot is focused on for women, you know, the menopause, perimenopause and menopause. And, and I feel like the andropause is not spoken about at all for poor men. So there is this softening uh, of the emotions, but there's nothing, it's not really, there's no education around it. But getting back to the pitta vata transition, um, I find that the, yeah, the pitta predominant constitution has a challenging time with it and almost needs a permission to kind of slow down because they went through that pitta stage of life pushing with intensity and goal oriented. And now they're there's a softening coming in and I talk to clients and they're like, they're, they're confused about what's going on with them. And once I explain it to them, it almost like, Oh, okay. So this is normal. <laughs> and I have permission to slow down. I don't have to prove my pitiness. Do you yeah. see that? Or have, have you felt that? I, yeah, personally. Yeah, I have. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm still having to remind myself, um, that it's okay to um, go for a walk, you know, or, or take, you know, take a longer walk with my dogs rather than getting another you know, half hour or an hour of work in every day. Yeah, I, it's, and it's, it is a challenge for those pit the dominant constitutions for sure. But, um, vodka, 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 <laughs> vodka teaches us anything. Uh-huh. Um, I try that sometimes. If vodka <laughs> teaches us anything, um, it's, it's that, um, the only way to to be in great health in the vata stage is to slow down mm. and to calm down and and to to ask Pitta to take a step back because this is not your stage. This is not this is not your lane. This is not your time. Yes. This is this is the time for vata to and but if pot if, if it, sorry if Pitta goes into that vata stage still. Uh, radiating in the way that it was in midlife then yeah i think that the vata is going to be quite upset by that mm. and uh, the aging process can be accelerated because the heating and drying aspects of at least the, especially the drying aspects of vata can be very damaging to the brain um right. and but a lot of a lot of uh, neuropsychological issues as we know in 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 the later stages of life and um we need to uh prevent those as much as possible. Yeah, and unfortunately the culture in the West doesn't help, particularly here in the US. You know, it, it's that, it's multitasking, it's intensity, it's long work hours, it's really that competitive um, lifestyle. And that doesn't help the pitta person to slow down because there's always this sense of, I have to keep achieving and multitasking and pushing. Yeah, and it lends to cardiovascular disease, heart right. attacks, Things are really pitta vata type of, um, well, except for congestive heart failure, those are maybe more kapha. But yeah, the the, the vata ness uh, certainly takes its toll. I mean, the pitta ness takes its toll toll on the heart and on the brain, and then the vata comes in and makes everything rigid. Yeah, and, and that's 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 devastating. It is. We need to relax. We need to soften into it. Yeah. We need to slow down and bring these simple dinacharya practices, like the one we talked earlier uh, about earlier, the abhyanga, the self uh, warm oil massage, into our into the pitta stage of life, into our thirties and forties, so that we have a more easeful transition, right, into the vata stage. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. 
and kind of calm that fire down. Now, I actually wanted to go back and ask you a little bit more about andropause because, like I said, it's it's really not talked about. And when I mention it, people don't have never heard of the word. And you know, when I do research on it, I often come uh, come up uh, on research that calls it a condition. <laughs> Yeah. So, and I just read that actually this week. I'm like, andropause is a condition. But but um, can you clarify that for me? Or have, you know, you're a man that has gone, gone through or going through andropause. And um, I mean, there's every, every man is affected by this transition. Well, yeah, but this is it's coming different. from the same Western medicine that calls pregnancy a condition. That's, that's yeah. true. So it's <laughs> true. Um, it, it is... It's, everything is a condition. I mean, every, everything is karmic and conditional, and it, it, you know. But but from the Western medical perspective, it's not a disease. Um, it, it is a gradual transition from the mid mid midlife uh, um, hormonal structure of a man into the elderly st- structure of a man hormonal. And everybody knows what that means. I mean, when you look at a man in his thirties and you look at a man in his seventies, they're different. Um, you know, that really tough dad becomes sweet grandpa. Yes. Oh, if you hopefully, you know, you would, you would hope. Yeah. And, um, if he lives long enough to enjoy that process, but I think it's more like a 10 to 20 year process, not a five year process like it is okay. in women. Okay. Yeah. Because it's, and a, they also you, don't, uh, they don't want to accept it. They don't yes. want to talk about it because it means that we become weak or yes. become, um, um, you know, what's the word? Um, um, I don't know that we just infertile, you know, there's just so many ways of looking at it in in a kind of a negative light. Yeah. But I think um, if we allow other cultures to guide us, I think this is really, uh, you know, a time of life for us to really take on uh, that softening as a way of, of embodying the wisdom and also allowing a little bit of the feminine to come in too, because that's what we do. We meet each other in the middle. Exactly. I have more balance. And like you reference what's going on right now with all this exposure of sexual assault and the Me Too campaigns, and that hopefully maybe this will open up the conversation about it's okay for men to be more vulnerable and that let go of that, you know, that, that very hard masculine cover, which served its purpose in the pitta stage of life, but now it's okay to become more emotional. I see many, you know, male friends who have a hard time going through this this stage and um yeah hopefully that there'll be there'll be more acceptance of it and then men will know that it's p- women love to see men <laughs> be more vulnerable and be and show their emotions yeah and it's not a sign of weakness no it's a sign of strength actually. absolutely and women love that at least all the women i know love it uh, <laughs> you know? all the women i know too right so men, yeah. if you're listening, be vulnerable, be emotional, uh-huh. and yeah, and show your emotions. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I want to ask you, as we finish up, about your retreats to India. You go every February, yep. is that right? Yep, February 1st to 12th. Um, there's two stages to the, uh, the tour. We do a week down in Kerala oh. on the beach, and we stay at one of the most respected uh, world-class Ayurveda centers um, uh, in just south of Trivandrum. Oh, beautiful. And um, we do two hours of treatments every day, mostly massages and shiradharas and oil baths and mm. just more rejuvenation. It's not a, a retreat for people with serious conditions. Um, it's, it's more for people who are exploring um, uh, rejuvenation. And it's also the way I have the retreat um, kind of a sequenced is that we spend that first week in total relaxation in the Ayurveda center because I want I want my guests uh, or fellow traveler, travelers to feel very relaxed as fast as possible yes. um, rather than taking, you know, like I did, three months to break through culture shock or cultural, you know, like kind of going through a little bit of resistance to some of the stuff I saw in India. Um, you can do it much faster if you do it in a much more loving and compassionate and sort of sattvic type of uh, space mm. and uh, it works and then by the, the eighth day we get on a plane and we go up north and in north india as you may know is much more intense uh, more crowded mm. and we go to varanasi and um, we go down early in the next morning and we watch the sunrise with the yogis there and the sadhus and um, to get in a rowboat and 
uh, tour all the temples that are along the, the banks of the Ganges. And uh, we do a little um, sunrise puja out in the middle of the river with uh, these flower offerings, and we make prayers. And um, from my experience, anything you ask for of the Divine Mother in that in that space um, comes true oh. uh, in- instantly. Uh, so you have to be careful what you ask for. Okay. Um, and uh, so we have a uh, process of preparing all, all our guests for that moment. It's it's about a ten minute. Um, uh, prayer and um, or, or whatever you want it to be um, and then uh, we tour the old city of Varanasi and you know there's temples and sadhus with dreadlocks down to their feet and mm. um, it's a trip Varanasi is is a, a, we, we go yeah it's just nutty we go back in the evening we watch uh, we go to the Manikarnika temple which is the cremation temple and we watch uh, cremations for about 45 minutes it's oh. about enough for most people to it's very transformative to watch that well yeah. and um in ritualized transition uh, of death um and we see a big rt a big ceremony to the to the divine mother this is a ceremony a celebration that's happened on the banks of the ganges and varanasi since the beginning of time every night rain or shine it, it's every single night for as long as they can remember and then we go um to Agra, and we see the Taj Mahal just as a, a little bucket list. Mm-hmm. Uh, fun. We have a little party that night at the hotel, and um, kind of close out the whole the whole experience. And then we go back to Delhi and fly out. So it's not it's not a lot of places, but it's the right places. Um, I know people who do tours who will take you to twenty like a different place every night, and you just wears you out. Oh yeah. So you have to find. A, a a sequence and a, a transfer a way of taking people from Western homes and businesses to India mm-hmm. through that transformation in a way that is um, realistic for people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And um, we I've found this sort of itinerary recipe you could call it that just works, and we're very pleased with it. Great. You've been doing it for a long time, haven't you? Yeah, I'm going back. Um, well, I've been to in India. I was, in India twice before I started touring, and then um, so about 15 times. And um, you can go to the web. We have a separate website for that. It's called SivantiAdventures.com. Okay. Um, Savanti Institute is the school. Great. SivantiInstitute.com. And um, yeah, Great. we still have a few spaces left. We're almost booked up for February, but people want to come along. They would, you know, give us a call. Oh, that sounds fantastic. How long is the retreat altogether? Uh, 12 days, okay. February 1st to the 12th. Sounds wonderful. Okay, and I'm going to put those links um, on the, in the show notes. So for the listeners out there, just check out the show notes, and I'll direct you right over to James's websites. So James, as we finish up here today, can you offer some little nugget of Ayurvedic wisdom or some other wisdom you want to share with the listeners today? Yeah, I mean, I would go back to, to, to my core kind of um, principle, which is that um, it Ayurveda has re- has taught me how important it is to be true to myself. Mm. There, there's no such thing as a, as a trend diet. There's no such thing as an Ayurvedic diet. There's no such thing. I mean, you can try them, and some people will get well, and some people might not. Some people might get worse. The, the most important thing you can do is learn who you are. Learn more about yourself. This is called vidya, or self-knowledge. <clears throat> and there's a a classic uh, Sanskrit um, uh, quote that I use a lot, um, Savidya ya vimuktaye, which means self-knowledge liberates us from all pain, sorrow, and disease. Oh, I love that. So if you're struggling, study yourself. And if you don't, if you can't see it, help someone to help you to know yourself. And be authentic. Be true to yourself. And I'm sure whatever you're struggling with will, will find its way back to balance. But to do that, it has to be authentic. Yeah. You have to be true to yourself. If you follow someone else's path, you won't get better. Yeah, absolutely. You have to understand yourself. And I think I've said this in mostly every episode in this podcast. What better study to undertake? It's not a selfish study. It's a necessary study to understand yourself first, to get to the truth yeah. of yourself. So you can go out there and and live your, your life and, and uh, live your what. You, your purpose and what you were here to do. Amen. Yeah. 
James, thank you so much. It was such a great conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. It was such a pleasure to have you on the show. And I wish you the best of luck, especially with New Bambino on the way. Best thank wishes you. to you and your family. Take good care of yourself. Thanks again. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with James. I certainly did. And you will find all the links for James's retreats and the Savanti Institute in the show notes. Now, by the time this show airs, it will be smack dab in the middle of the holidays. And I hope you're having a happy and healthy holiday season. And make sure to take care of you during the holidays. It's not selfish or self-indulgent. It's actually necessary so that you can be at your best for your family, friends, and your community. You can check out my latest blog post where I give tips for staying healthy and balanced over the holiday season. Now, in early 2018, I'm going to be doing another group online cleanse starting January 19th. This is going to be an all-natural, whole food cleanse, which is holistic also, including yoga videos, meditation, and breath work. And the difference with this cleanse is that it's tailored to you. So I do a 90-minute online consult with each individual and tailor the recipes, the meditation, the yoga, the breath work, and whatever else is necessary to bring you back into balance. You can find out all the details on my website under the events page, and I'll put a link in the show notes here. So if you're ready to start 2018 feeling light and clear and energetic, go ahead and register for my Digestive Reset Cleanse and then you can book your online consultation. It's best to do it sooner as spaces are limited. If you have questions as to whether the cleanse is for you, take advantage of my 30-minute free discovery call. You can also book that online, and I'll put a link to that also in the show notes. And now I leave you for the last podcast episode of 2017, and I just want to say thank you for your support. I started this podcast in late 2017, and I have just been so grateful for the support I've received, the reviews, and for you sharing this podcast with others, especially those you feel will really benefit from this information. And I look forward to bringing you much more info and guests in 2018. Thank you so much. I wish you a happy and healthy holiday season, and I look forward to connecting with you in 2018. Take good care of yourself and be well.